nationally recognized, award-winning monthly LGBTQIAP plus TV news magazine. I'm Roberta Gonzalez Gray. Pre-pandemic times, Outlook Video was brought to you via the Create TV studios in San Jose. Though the Bay Area is now experiencing improved pandemic tier status, we continue to bring you coverage via Zoom. We do hope this finds you all safe and well as we slowly move forward to a healthier recovery. It is with pleasure I now introduce you to Mary Farrell. She is co-author with Martha Mobley, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, researcher and grandniece of modern medicine heroine, Mary McMillan, the mother of physical therapy. Mary, thank you for joining us today and welcome to Outlook Video. I'm very happy to join you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, this is great. Um, besides having the same name, you've in, you inherited uh, some other things. So we didn't want to go on the story as how this book came about um, and how that it was that, um, that you came to, um, to, to inherit this name. Yes. Well, <clears throat> when I was a, a child uh, growing up in Phoenix, Arizona, my grandmother lived four blocks away. She was the sister of Mary McMillan. So um, when Mary McMillan died in 1959, uh, my grandmother, we, we called her Nana, uh, inherited uh, all of uh, Mary McMillan's personal belongings and uh, her estate as well. And all of her papers, her diaries, her photos, her, uh, her letters home, uh, we're in a very, very large trunk, and that's where all the material came from. So all right. I had to do yes. it. <laughs> that took some sifting as well, didn't it? Oh, it, it did. <laughs> it did. It did. And we're so glad you did because this brought up this woman of whom most people do not know this name, and not people don't, and much less her story. And it's great that you've brought all this together as the story of the mother of physical therapy. Now, many of us have had from time to time of the recipient's ends of physical therapy. Yes. Um, yes, in one form or another, even if it's just doing some stretches, um, you know, that you do daily when you first get out of bed, but other times it's more, you know, uh, it's more towards a healing process and a recovery from surgeries or, or diseases or things of that nature. But, um, this woman, your great aunt, was the one who brought all of this together. Um, now, she started off in Boston, went to England, um, and then went to uh, many different places. So can you elaborate on how she started this and, and kind of sure. like, uh, give us a time frame for her? Sure, sure. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was because almost everybody gets physical therapy at one time or another in their life. Right. And so it's like a household name. And I thought it's time that somebody find out who this woman is. They all know who Florence Nightingale was. So we need to find out and know who Mary McMillan is. So she started out, um, she was educated in England in Liverpool. And uh, uh, she came to the, born in the United States, and Liverpool uh, educated and lived with her aunt. And then uh, she came to the United States and the First World War was going on. So she, um, she, she practiced her, uh, her massage and physical therapy with various orthopedic doctors. But then when the war was over, uh, the Surgeon General uh, asked some of these famous orthopedic doctors, who can we get to train someone to heal the soldiers from all of their injuries and all of their amputations and put them back together again so they can live and have a life. And they all said, well, we know this woman and she's working at a children's hospital in Maine, but we'll, we'll get her here. So she, she came there. Yes, so in 1915, that's when she became the director of the uh, Clinic of Children's Hospital in Portland, Maine. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So, so then from there, she went on to um, uh, be sworn into, was she actually sworn into the U.S. Army? Yes, she was. She was sworn wow. into the U.S. Army and uh, the photo on the front of the cover of the book 
as her in her army uniform almost. But anyway, this was in 1918 and she went to Reed College in uh, Portland, Oregon to teach some young women how to become uh, physical therapists. They were called war reconstruction aides at the time. So yes, it didn't. It didn't have the name of physical therapy at that no, time, did it not? It certainly okay. did not. It certainly did okay. not. But then, Mary McMillan, uh, after that training, there were trainings all over the United States at various army stations, and she called all of the uh, people that were in the schools and said, "Now that you're trained, let's start an organization." And mm-hmm. she sent something out, and they unanimously said, "Yes, let's do it." So therefore. It took a long time, but in New York City, at uh, at a famous restaurant, uh, they all met and they started the Mer- first American Physical Therapy Association. And was that before she wrote the the best selling book? Was also massage therapy and exercise. She had done that between her teaching and ah. then her starting uh, uh, the the organization. So that also helped her to get well known. Oh, it did. It did indeed. Yes. Okay. Okay. And then in 1932, the Rockefeller, Found- Rockefeller Foundation, um, I believe she was uh, the, the chief of the of a area there and went to the Union College in China. Can you uh, describe that and how, how she came to yes, go to the um, Asian countries? Um, she also taught at Harvard Medical School. And so she was teaching there. And um, the Rockefeller Foundation... Uh, she became aware of it. And what the Rockefeller Foundation was doing at that time was sending Americans over to various countries uh, that did not have a standardized medicine. And they said, we're gonna send you to these countries, you need to teach these uh, various things at medical schools. And we are doing it because we want medicine to be completely standardized throughout the world. And that's that what shows so did. much that I tend to interrupt, but that shows so much confidence and esteem that they held for your great aunt, yes. who obviously obviously knew what she was doing. In 1941, uh, let's see, she um, she found herself stranded because of the Second World War. Can yes. you elaborate on that? Yes, I can. Um, so that, she stayed in China uh, for uh, eight years. And um, then she came home for a break and she signed up for another eight years. But the, uh, the, the president at the time said, we don't think you ought to go over because there's going to be a war. And that was in 1940. Well, she went over anyway because she was going to teach somebody to take her place and uh, she couldn't just sit there. That's the way she was. So <laughs> she went back and uh, she was teaching another physical therapist, uh, the, the, how to do uh, a department and set up a department and how to do the teaching. And then uh, there were many, many warnings uh, in China and about uh, the war coming on. So they had to leave Beijing, China, which at that time was called Peiping, China. Mm. And they went to Hong Kong to wait for a ship to take them, repatriate them back to the United States. So many American teachers and missionaries, people of that uh, quality uh, basically went to Hong Kong and were told, as soon as we get a ship, it'll come in Manila and it'll be there and you will board it and repatriate back to America before the war starts. Well, they waited and they waited and then finally they got the call they went there and they went to Manila. And as soon as they got to Manila, the Japanese were bombing. And so uh, the Japanese bombed uh, Pearl Harbor, was it not? Does that it was right after that. Coincide with as that? In fact, right it was the that? day after that. So there oh, was really goodness. no warning at all. Oh my goodness, bad so timing. She was, she was stranded. Um, she volunteered to work in the hospital for the people that were injured. And then finally, um, the Japanese said, uh, anybody who's here, um, we're going to gather you and put you into an internment camp. And that is what they did. And there were oh approximately 3,000 of those people. And they were in uh. a old university 
run by the Jesuits called San Tomas. And uh, there, you know, this is all part of history and it's written in history of, about what happened there. But yes. um, they were there for four years and uh, many of them died from starvation and from oh, lack yes. of nutrition and lack of proper medicine. Okay. So um, she, she was there and uh, she almost died as well. And uh, once she was healed, uh, and the book talks a great deal about this, then um, she was able to come home and uh, uh, took her talk three about months. A strong, talk about a strong woman, yes. Yes, yes, it yes. took her three months to get home and uh, wow. back to Boston. Uh, and, uh, but their ship was bombed. Uh, so, you know, they couldn't really do anything. So I gathered all of her diaries together as well. And uh, that's part of the book. Oh, and, excellent. Uh, most of the time, she, in fact, all of the time, she was very positive, a very positive person and told a lot of personal stories. So, uh, and, uh, and then she had letters back home and I included some of those letters in the book. And uh, so, you know, when she came home, it was also a very big headline because it was home in New York. And uh, um, so many, many people were aware of it and it made the news. So I after that, she, so. was, yes. she, she was asked to speak at various uh, events in the Boston area. And yeah. she continued her work as uh, one of the top leaders at that time in physical therapy. Well, the great thing is that she was able to pass this on to uh, over these generations and, and people such as myself were able to reap the rewards of, uh, of physical therapy. What a legacy to have. Yes, she also a left a, a good part of her fortune to, uh, to the American Physical Therapy Association. Ah. And every year they have a Mary, Mary McMillan scholarship and a Mary McMillan lecture. So wonderful. This That's has gone wonderful. On all these years. Indeed, what a legacy. What a legacy to 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 have uh, in your in, in your family history as well. Yes. So this yes. is great. And yes. she was a, 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 a single woman all this time. Um, so that not only shows shows that her strength that she didn't uh, though I mean, I'm sure she had the help of others, but it sounds like she was pretty um, uh, standing on her own kind of gal. She was definitely standing on her own. And uh, when yeah. she started the physical therapy departments, mm -hmm. she went out and had a bunch of uh, doctor's uh, pads printed out uh, with their name on it and said, doctor, here's a, print, here's a pad, please prescribe physical therapy for this patient. So she gave them all the pads because <laughs> they didn't quite- Sign here, doctor. Get her, yeah. <laughs> they didn't quite get it. And then finally it just really took hold. So wow. she, what, you know, what a she tenacious, was, strong woman. Yes, yeah, indeed. she was very strong. Yeah. Uh, but the book is no. available. The book is available on Amazon.com. And the webpage is www.marymcmillan.com. And uh, Macmillan is spelled M-C-M-I-L-L-A-N. Thank you so much for sharing this, for sharing that book. We shall You're look forward welcome. to seeing it. Mary Macmillan, the mother of physical therapy. Again, thank you this, Mary, for uh, being with us today on Outlook Video. You are very welcome. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. So I'm Gabrielle Antolovich, and I've been thinking a lot about how important it is for all of us to work together as opposed to us just doing our own little thing. Now that sounds very similar to what everyone is saying, but I really wanna talk about 
why that's important. See, I was born in 1950 and my parents are immigrants from Yugoslavia. They were recruited, all Europeans were recruited to America and Australia to do the work that nobody else wanted to do. And of course, like good immigrants, they had dreams about a wonderful life. And unfortunately, I was born five months after they arrived in Australia, in Sydney. And, you know, the people, even though the government recruited them, the people hated immigrants. And so I got really scared that um, the way my parents were treated, I thought people were gonna take my parents away. So at two, I started attacking people who were attacking my parents because I was scared. And that was the first time I felt that power inside of me. But what that did for me was I felt betrayed. I felt betrayed by a country that said that they wanted my parents there. Now at two, I didn't have the word betrayed, but I had a sense of betrayal emotionally. I felt that the world was not a safe place. And my parents kept saying, we are the only people that will ever love you. Uh, because nobody else out there is going to love you. And then, of course, when I came out gay, they rejected me. And that was a different kind of betrayal because they promised to love me as I am. And they didn't. And you know that there is a word for it in the foster care system. They call it losing permanency. It's when your family rejects you for whatever reason and you, you, know, you either have to run away because it's an abusive household or they kick you out because you're um, gay or lesbian or transgender or not what they want. I wasn't a frou-frou little girl. I got betrayed because my mother wanted me to be a pink tutu ballerina and I wasn't that. I didn't like ballet. Uh, we now call it non-binary gender queer, but we didn't have the words for that back then. You know, my mother used to say, well, what are you, a tomboy? And I'm going, no, I'm not a tomboy, but I'm not a girl. <laughs> and it's like, so what are you? And here's an adult asking me as a six-year-old that was going, I don't wanna wear that pinky poofy dress. She's asking me, then what am I? You know, it's like, hello. So here's where the betrayal keeps happening on the inside, even when children don't have the words for it. I knew I was being betrayed by my parents because they didn't like me anymore because I wasn't what they wanted. Any movement does not just poof, happen in a vacuum. This was the precursor to women's liberation. And, uh, <clears throat> and me being rejected as a non-binary person without the language, you know, it's like, ew, we don't like you because you're not like this prissy little girl to show up. Um, what's the precursor to the LGBTQ plus movement, you know, I was a precursor to that. And so, you know, what, why am I talking about that? The reason why I'm talking about this is that betrayal is a huge emotion, especially if it happens from a country that says they want you and parents who said they would love you always. When that betrayal happens, that loss of permanency left me personally with nothing. And when you have nothing, this is the amazing thing. 
I felt like my world had fallen apart and I left home um, because there was no home anymore. And so I really felt that the universe was trying to keep me alive and kept bringing people into my life that were uplifting enough to keep me on the planet. Isn't that interesting? And it's really simple things sometimes because, you know, my parents were, especially my mother, she was very picky about everything. You know, she said that I didn't look right. And me, 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 me. So when people said, I like your hair, something as simple like that would wash away my mother's negativity permanently not just for that moment. I was really amazed. And I started talking to people about that. And they said that was a spiritual awakening. When something as simple as that can take away your karma or take away something that has been burdening you since day one, betrayal is a very deep wound and that all minorities have this wound whether you're um, one of the Asian people whether you're one of the um, African American people whether you're part of the Latinx um, genre whether you're LGBTQ plus we have all been deeply wounded by betrayal. And so what happens is that when we get together, we feel that betrayal even with each other if we're not getting along. And this is where as part of June Pride Month, be patient with other minorities about their betrayal wounds, whether they talk about it or not, standable. So as a spiritual act and as an act for June Pride Month, let's be more patient with each other and curious and ask each other, how were you betrayed? And so that brings me to the Billy DeFrank LGBTQ plus community center. We are a conglomeration of everybody. You know, we're not just LGBTQ plus, but we're also um, all races, all ethnicities and castes. And so as a center that is a safe place, oh my God, you know, we've been shut down for over a year. And what are the issues that we have to address as we prepare opening up? The safety issues are huge because people who hate minorities of any kind, immigrants, people of color, people of different ethnicities, people who speak different languages, LGBTQ+, different religions, whatever, have been emboldened to hate. So I am not naive that when we fling the doors open that every person coming through is one of us who loves being with us, right? So we have to really be mindful of our safety issues. I want our community and our allies to feel safe here and that all of our volunteers are trained in understanding what to do and also how to recognize people that are not quite for us. There's a certain vibe about that. So that's part one and part two is we are developing all these new kinds of programs and new ideas 
about being at the Billy DeFrank Center. I'm not going to do too many spoilers, except for one spoiler that the Center for Creative Living is going to be at the Billy DeFrank Center. Yes! Oh my goodness! So that is a big spoiler. The other spoiler I'm going to give you is that 2021 is um, the Billy DeFrank Center's 40th anniversary. And because of COVID, we can't have a big old whoop whoop. So what we're doing is we're going to have a whole series of different fabulous events that people can at least get to one of them. We love to get mail from you. Email us at comments at outlookvideo.org. To contact us by phone, call 408-293-3040, extension 205. Visit our website at outlookvideo.org. Subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash outlookvideo. And connect with us at facebook.com slash outlookvideo. June being Pride Month, there are many things to explore and enjoy. And one of those things is the Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project Film Festival. It's an annual festival uh, that this 21-year organization has been doing for the last 17 years. And it's a free, free, mind you, free festival that you can enjoy virtually. There will be um, different topics ranging from forging traditions going back to the generations and different ethnicities and different issues within families and friends. Love that endures, it's a kaleidoscope of queer love and whimsy of fragments of heartbreak and um, facts of love and self-love. Then there's one divining home about Asian lesbians mapping and rediscovering the memories of queer and transgender people of color. Now, all of these films will be aired June 11th, 12th, and 13th, starting at 7 p.m. And all of the films are subtitled for the deaf and hard of hearing, ASL interpreted, and making them all accessible and enjoyable for everyone. You can go to their website, which is festival2021.qwocmap.org and find these films for yourself. They're all short films, um, ranging from just a few minutes to 35 minutes, but you think you're going to enjoy the variety and the creativity which the queer women of color will be presenting you. Having said that, happy Pride, everyone.